Welcome to Best Kept Secrets Travel, episode 14. My name's Morgan. And I'm Will. And on today's episode, I'm going to be talking through one of the best experiences of my life. And I can't wait to tell you what it is. Best friends and that's for life. Who stay traveling? I'm talking worldwide. 65 countries between the two. Every moment is so unbelievable. Sharing the best kept secrets about the trips and mistakes they made that they can't forget. So tell me if you're ready for a time to remember as they gear up for the next adventure. Yeah. Woo! Best kept secrets travel. So during that intro, what you will probably wondering is what is the bucket list adventure which I ticked off a few years ago? Traveling with me. No, a lot better. Huh? A tiny bit hairier, better looking. I was fortunate enough to go to Rwanda to go and see the gorillas. Ooh. I know. As well as actually some of the golden monkeys over there, which were equally as cool. But the gorillas were something else. Because when you're right next to a silverback gorilla, the sheer size of the thing, <laughs> just looking at you like, yeah, if, if you really, really, really deep down wanted to, you'd kill us all. <laughs> it's like, pretty it's, much. I could not stop you. Then again, you know, the, the conservation guys with you with their uh, machetes and AK 47s probably would stop it. Uh, well, after a maybe few after, minutes. yeah, after. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Might after, take a while. <laughs> and, and also, probably after the first couple of people have been killed. Then, then they'll have reacted yeah. and started to save Actually you. shooting the rest of the talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're conservationists. We're saving the animals, so we're killing the rest of you. The largest living primate is gorillas, and they're spread across much of equatorial African rainforest. Broadly speaking, the species are split into lowland gorillas and mountain gorillas. The volcanic mountain range spans across Rwanda, Uganda, and Democratic Republic of Congo, being the home to the endangered mountain gorilla and golden monkeys. Ooh. At latest count, there are approximately 1,000 mountain gorillas in the wild, and 604 are in the Virunga Massif. The population is slowly increasing thanks to the concerted efforts between the governments and the NGOs. If you didn't know this already, a big group family, otherwise known as a troop in the gorilla world, they think there are 12 of them throughout the Volcanic National Park in the area. And Ooh. they all study for scientific research, so they try and keep track of them all. That's fantastic. This is a slightly different style of episode to what we've normally done, in that this is an experience that only Will has done so far. I actually did try and go to uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo to see gorillas in 2020, which was not a good year to go travelling, so... It didn't happen in the end, but basically the format we've got for today's episode is majority me asking William questions. I'm being interviewed, interrogated by Morgan. And him hopefully answering them with the answers that I want. Let's give it a crack. Yeah, so what made you first want to go visit gorillas? So if you've been a keen watcher or listener of this podcast so far you will probably realize by now that i love wildlife wildlife photography being around animals and the conservation of wildlife especially all these endangered species that we have out there so that's that's one of the big things and i think if i was to write down a list of the dream animals to see which at that point in time i hadn't so far gorillas mm -hmm. was really high up there i've still got pandas and tigers which i really yeah. want to see and funnily enough i was hoping to go on a go to india to go and see the tigers last year once again 2020 not a great year for it no not but gorillas being i'd call the alpha primate i know we as humans think we are but when you're just in the presence of them the sheer mm. size of them and then when you just watch them play and just lying around you just think we are so similar is it strange to see yeah how similar they are how they've got human like features? even just one of the things that happened was a tiny little imagine you okay you're you're a new mum you've got your little toddler at home <laughs> it was identical imagine you're a new mum or new dad and your toddler you're just lying down on the sofa having a little sleep and the toddler just jumps on your stomach how do you know what that's like and just start smacking I've got three <laughs> tiny cousins, Morgan. Okay, just check. It's just the same. <laughs> it's like they, when they're a lot younger, they used to try and climb over everything. Yeah. 
And Baby Gorilla did the exact same thing, just like Little Toddler. It was super, super young. And I'll try and put up some photos if you're watching this on YouTube at the moment. They might be around the place. Wow. And this tiny little baby gorilla just stood on its mum, hit its mum's chest, and then he looked at us. And then he raised his chest up as if he was trying to size it up and like tapped his chest lightly. And we just all laughed. Aww. And it's like the mum just almost like slapped him off his chest, <laughs> off her chest. And it was just like, we were just laughing and you just yeah. look at them and like it's way too similar and you just start looking at the hands the feet the way they pull the grass and the bamboo shoots out of the ground and it's like it's a bizarre thing when you start to realize how similar we are to the other primates yeah. out there is is there any reason that you chose well rwanda and mountain gorillas specifically or did you just want to see gorillas so i wanted to see gorillas mountain gorillas are the ones where you're meant to be able to get the best you can interaction like a very intimate interaction you're very close to them and rwanda was on one of my list of countries to really mm -hmm. go to so we were in rwanda for a few days saw the gorillas and then we flew to botswana to go through the okavanga delta mm -hmm. but as other people on the podcast will already know if you've been listening or watching us is africa is my outright favorite continent so i'm trying to mm -hmm. tick off all the countries before i die Bar antarctica Obviously, haven't done that yet, though, Morgan. That's going to take a while. Nudge, nudge, if there's a sponsor out there who would like to sponsor us for a trip to Antarctica. We're there. We'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's Rwanda. And funnily enough, the government website stated, oh, Rwanda's dangerous. They had a genocide in mm. 1990s. Don't go. They're still around. Nicest people in the world. Super amazing. Mm -hmm lovely culture and then when you come to the gorilla side of it there's now this deep passion within the locals which funnily enough like diane fossey really brought there but it's super rooted now that they do want to try and preserve them and keep them because it's it's part of their country and who they are and and you've talked spoken about antarctica being expensive and yeah. us, us getting sponsors for there is is seeing the mountain gorillas affordable is it so, for anyone wondering, as I did state at the beginning, the volcanic range spans across Rwanda, Uganda, and Democratic Republic mm -hmm. of Congo. So, there are three places that you can go and see the mountain mm -hmm. gorillas. In Rwanda, you can see the golden monkeys as well, mm -hmm. which is super lovely. And they were also poached for their, for their fur because they've got this lovely golden collar I'll try and get. So, when you're looking at the pricing, it's... Democratic Republic of Congo is the cheapest mm -hmm. at around four hundred dollars for yeah. one permit, and then you've got Uganda is about six to seven hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and then Rwanda, as of twenty twenty, I think right at the beginning, just before COVID actually hit, they jumped their permit, which was already the most expensive. It was seven hundred fifty US dollars, mm -hmm. and they increased. They literally doubled it out of nowhere to fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Which was quite a big hit, but then they came out because it's such a popular. popular place to go and see them. I don't actually know why people mm -hmm. so love going to Rwanda. I think it might be the country or the setup slightly different to see them. But they doubled it so that they slightly reduced the numbers going. They know mm -hmm. people will still go and yeah. pay to see it. And by reducing the physical numbers going around them, you're keeping the habitat for them a bit more mm -hmm. natural you're less destructive to the habitat so you don't let's say you half the footfall but you keep up the revenue yeah. the exact same way you're reducing damage to the wildlife giving them a better lifestyle mm -hmm. whilst getting equal amount of money it's sort of the dream for any conservation team in the world yeah so that's the reason why that permits increased so on an affordability rwanda's really now pushing it and it's become a bit mm -hmm. more exclusive um, but I went back in 20, I think 2018, 2017, mm -hmm. 2018, when I had $750, which is still mm -hmm. expensive. But the flip side is how many times in your life do you go and walk mm -hmm. around gorillas and be with a troop of gorillas? Very true. So just to be clear, so unlike maybe going to Richmond Park and seeing the deer, yeah. so that you can go in for free, yeah. you're, you're not even talking about a, a buying a tour. You're just talking about getting a permit to be allowed to go in it's this the area. equivalent of buying going it. to a national trust area right mm -hmm. 
or you've gone, let's say, the majority of national trust is places free, but you want to go and do this one particular thing. We'll use giant scores where we've spoken about it before. You've, if you're going through the centre. you said it's free. Yeah. You're free, but if you go through the centre, you might pay, let's say, five euros. So, so what it's really like is or five it's pounds. buying a ticket it's to go to Thought Park. Yeah, yes, basically. exactly. Thought Park, Chessington, World Adventures, any of that is like buying a ticket to the zoo, right? <laughs> that That is a good example. That, the one we probably should have used, the one with animals. It's the same as that, just London zoos. I mean, London zoos rip off anyway. But London zoos, like, I, don't know, it's, I can't even remember now, 20, 30 quid for like an adult bath. It's really yeah. expensive. Um, but it's $750. To get the permit. And then how much are the tours, roughly? I... I can't remember. So I was I was looking at tours in Democratic Republic of Congo and they were roughly the trip was roughly I think about twelve hundred pounds and slightly including less than a the permit week, not including a permit. That's not. But that's you go to Rwanda, you fly to Rwanda and then you uh go by land into the Democratic Republic of Congo and then go in. Okay. Yeah, so they the thing is, though, I know in Rwanda, I don't know about the other two. They also li- they limit the amount of tickets per day. So let's say in Rwanda, they've got six different troops of gorillas. Mm-hmm. Within those troops, they limit how many people can go and see them each day. So I think in Rwanda specifically, it's six. Six, six. tracking tickets per troop per day. Okay. And there are 96 in total-ish, mm-hmm. roughly. Roughly, yeah. Um so it is exclusive in yeah. the real w- realms of it all. Um, I don't know if they do run it 365 days a year, obviously, with the mm-hmm. weather change and probably wanting to Depends on leap keep a slight well. conservation side of it. <laughs> exactly. Good old leap year, Morgan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, many th- so many times in my life that, you know, you, you spend money on loads of different holidays, mm-hmm. but there are a few which will stay with you the same as when yeah. you have a seriously like intense intimate interaction with any wild mm-hmm. animal because yeah. at the end of the day we joked about saying a zoo but a zoo you know they're in captivity they mm-hmm. are quite literally behind barricades they're fed a certain diet every day well even with some safaris in africa they're almost feels like slightly overcrowded when there's multiple different trucks basically yeah the worst i've ever had that was in the masai mara I think Which around we'll probably talk about in another episode. I know, and that that drives me crazy that because that's such you know they're doing it for conservation, blah blah blah. But at mm-hmm. the same time, when you see there are literally two lines, and I can't remember we counted how many trucks. It's like thirty five trucks around just mm-hmm. two lines. It was like I might as well have been at a zoo by that yeah. point. I'd have less people watching the same <laughs> line if I was at a zoo. zoo. Yeah, and as if I was at that point. Yeah, but yeah. So with the gorillas, it's. It's very intimate. It's a small mm-hmm. amount of permits given. And everyone, you get up pretty early in the morning to get there. That's fine. It's a short hike, but then it's, everyone's super excited, mm-hmm. which is such a nice thing. I think we went and saw the, I think we saw the golden monkeys first. And then you go and see the gorillas. Start small and get bigger. Yeah, but the golden monkeys are hilarious because they're moving through the trees really quickly. Mm-hmm. And then they come down to the ground as well and eat, fall off the ground. Mm-hmm. So, you're never meant to approach them. Yeah. But if you're just stood there and they come closer to you. food. Well, yeah. But if you're if you're just stood there and they come closer to you along the ground and they're eating grass, blah, 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 then you can get fairly close. I think, you know, I got mm. a few metres away from one of the golden monkeys. Yeah. And they just look so cuddly. Oh. I've got like the biggest chubby little cheeks. Oh, that's cute. Quite clearly. Yeah. You flew to Rwanda. I did. Which is a fairly normal mode of transport for getting to new countries. Yep. And obviously you probably got uh, taxis or buses yeah. to get close. Once you actually got to the location, uh, how did you like travel and how did you get to the gorillas? How did you get to seeing them? So we'll take it back from the airport, right? Super simple. Taxi. No, so our hotel. <laughs> the hotel had their own sort of transfer cars. Yeah which over there are sort of big defenders, as mm-hmm. a lot of them seem to be. And to our surprise, due to the genocide and 
that's a bigger, longer story. But due to the genocide in Rwanda and all of the community service, I think they are the best roads I've ever been on in the world. They are the widest roads mm-hmm. and the most perfect tarmac roads I think I've ever been on in my life. It was insane. Is the roads look perfect. You could fit lorry side by side mm-hmm. everywhere in the whole country. But the irony is the roads look immaculate, yet all the cars are typical. Yeah. The motorbikes look like they're 80 years old and they've mm-hmm. got four people on the back of them. Yeah. And the ta- local taxi is the most common thing on motorbikes. Oh, I love that. So all the locals, because it's so much cheaper, yeah. instead of them having big cars, which are really expensive run, blah, 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 more to fix, all the taxis slash mini bus things, they're just bikes. Everyone's going around on tiny little cheap motorbikes. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So just quickly explain what is this community service thing? So if you want to look into genocide, I recommend you doing that. That's not what the basis of this episode is on, but is an output of the genocide. Everyone who has been trialed for murder and everything, they had a choice. Be in jail for, let's say, 30 years, or you do 15 years of community service. So you're allowed 50% off your sentence if that was just doing community service. So the majority of people took that. They helped build roads, build infrastructure for the whole of the country. So it just, overnight, they were just like, right, just go and work. 15 years, do that instead of 30 years sat in a cell, which 30 years in a cell costs the country more money etc so it became unbelievably mm. productive then the output of this was they then promised that as a community they'd always be together because they never want no one in the world ever wants that to happen just no. like the sadness there's a memorial museum which i highly recommend if you're ever in rwanda you go there the last room i guarantee you'll walk out in tears like mm-hmm. everyone did i did my whole family did everyone else who walked out of it because it's just about it's like, sounds bad. Imagine like a Top Trump's card telling you your best facts. And they just had these huge panels of about 30 kids which got murdered in the genocide. And it was a photo of the kid, their name, their age, their favorite food, their favorite subject in school, and a little description about them from like a family member or something. Mm. And you walk through there and you just pull your eyes out. Yeah. Like the genocide's bad enough, but then when you really give... Mm-hmm personality to some of the victims that's when it's intense that's when you get attachment so then every last sunday in rwanda the whole country is expected to do community service unless you're super elderly ill emergency services you have to do it and it starts from the top so the president of rwanda sets a precedent for it he will go out every sunday he's been seen picking up litter so community service is anything in this thing it's not like they go around saying right morgan you have to go build a house this weekend it is you go out and do something and mm-hmm. i think it lasts five hours or six hours every last sunday so the streets are not just immaculate they are spotless yeah there is no rubbish in the country plastic bags are illegal makes sense. so you have to use paper bags anyway so it's even cleaner and more yeah. environmentally friendly the president's been seen sweeping streets, helping build local houses right next to the, I say hotel, it wasn't really a hotel, it was like a more sort of small resort thing. The village which they're connected to and they help mm-hmm. out. So they, they because obviously they needed some for the hotel, yeah. they also supplied a proper water source, proper mm-hmm. electricity to the local village. And the community service Sunday, which just gone before we arrived, the staff in the hotel were telling us the whole community came together in the most elderly village and elderly lady in the village, they built her a house. Oh my goodness. Because they're like, her house is about to fall down. And we're not talking, you know, big house. These are yeah. small, single story, almost hut, hut to most people, but they all went out and built a house. And all the kids, you're not, I think it's everyone over the age of 16 or 14, but mm-hmm. all the kids want to get involved. The second yeah. their mums and dads are out and I they're mean, helping would. build it, it's insane. Yeah. And just that sense of community is massive. Yeah. And that's what is really nice to see. And when now when they go and vote, they all get a tiny dot, like a tattoo dot on their finger, and they all come back to the village and like holding their hand up, really proud that they've come oh, to vote. Cool. So their voting numbers are through the roof. Yeah. And I think, but the problem was the most recent election when I was out there, they thought was was a big, you know, hoax, mm-hmm. a bit like the classic US election rubbish. 
is I think the president won by something like he got eighty five percent of the vote. Oh wow, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But every everyone we spoke to was like, oh no, we voted for him. Yeah, I was like, oh okay, so he, yeah. he must be popular. Fair enough. Well, that, that that's good to see. And I mean, going back to the gorillas, obviously it's not always like this. We have spoken that their numbers are slightly increasing now because yeah. of all the work that people are doing to help them and stop poaching. Uh, why is it important to support the gorillas and help these habitats and these animals? So in 1967, Diane Fossey set up the Karasuki Research Center mm-hmm. in the Varinga Mountains in Rwanda. Yeah. And back then, locals, poachers, farmers all believed this big stereotype image that gorillas were brutes they're aggressive they if you if a human comes across one they're going to kill you and they want to kill you Mm -hmm. back then she went out and she went and lived with a troop of gorillas up in the mountains yeah and showed she brought a cameraman with her you know good old back 1967 (laughs) not like a nice dls dslr like we have now but she was showing that when you spend time around them they're really not different to us yeah they don't have the same sort of evolving capacity that we do mm. intellectually, hence why we've created everything around us and we, we're we smart that we create tools. But when you see them, they do in the same way. Yeah, You know, all primates will use rocks and leaves mm-hmm. and different things as tools. And Diane Fossey then, having lived with them, proved everyone wrong. Well, I believe she approached them by mimicking them. So that's what you do even now. Yeah. So, yes, so she started to create that. She was... The main one that in the troop you have to impress because each troop's got a silverback. Mm-hmm. You have to make them happy. Then everyone else is happy. If the silverback's not happy, then no one's happy. Mm. It's all about the silverback. And when you go in, you're told this on, on, on your guide and they're deadly serious. This isn't them trying to wind you up. You know, imagine going into Wales, right? And being like, oh no, to go through a field with sheep, you need to start going, bah. could you imagine that? It's like, we'll go, you know, all right. Okay, down in this National Trust site, by the way, this field to get through and survive the cows, you all need to go. And then they're going to, you know, they're like Dairy Lee's going to start celebrating. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. <laughs> That's not going to happen. It is you need the gorillas to be nice to you. <laughs> Otherwise, they just will kill you. And we heard of hilarious stories of, I think it was like a 14 year old girl was there and mm. one of the male gorillas wasn't the silverback just walked over and grabbed her hand and started walking off with her. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just like, you I, give you, away. I only, give you my child. There's, there's only so much you can do in that situation. Yeah. Um, but you go in and you're meant to go quite deep mm-hmm. and you're meant to go, mm, mm, because all the gorillas to the silverback just made us, mm, mm, mm. And you just keep looking at the silver and go, and they just watch you. And here's a photo of the silver back. He's mahusive. Ooh. <laughs> but you're just constantly talking. If if everyone suddenly goes quiet, then it gets a bit weird. So you mm-hmm. hear just everyone go, just like constantly, just almost chatting to them. So do you do that the whole time you're there, or do you just do that until they get used to you? You don't. You're not like a broken record. You're not just hello. <laughs> no, you're not like that. You just do it like every so often. Okay. Like, you know, just like you're talking to, you know, going to your friend's house, you see a cat, you obviously just go, meow. Like, no, you don't really, but. I was about to say, is that obvious? <laughs> <laughs> but they're a different beast to anything that I've really come across before. Yeah. Because you can have a conversation in that sense. Yeah, they're not talking to you, but it's the same interaction back and forth of mm. Mm. and they'll sometimes do it back to you so because of that is it very different to any other sort of animal experiences that you've had yeah, yeah. I've, there have been ways that you can interact with an animal but it's so different being a primate mm. so different you know even with different types of monkeys and chimps that i've come across before so vervet monkeys for anyone who doesn't know they're the cheekiest little things ever well, and you see you them, them you see them all over africa I've seen them in parts of Indonesia as well, and they cause havoc because they're so mm. intelligent. They're tiny. I've seen them lifting up the lids of teapot and seeing what's in them and putting it back <laughs> down, 
or they'll just watch you in the split second that you're a certain distance away from the food. They'll dive in, grab it, and run off, mm-hmm. and then like reset with their team. And they're they're just mental. But then you see the personality of them. You're like, it is just like yeah. Once again, it's like toddlers. They yeah. just have some of the, some of these tiny monkeys just have that cheeky mentality. Well, that's of why a little you call toddler. toddlers cheeky monkeys. Yeah, they're trying to steal all of your food. Sweets. <laughs> exactly. The yeah. Sweets. You're trying to find the sweet straw. But no, that that's it. Is, I've never had an animal experience like it, and I know I won't again unless mm. I went and did something similar. Is tourism, yeah, and sort of contact with people good for the gorillas and good for the environment that they live in? Is it a good thing? Do you think? Is it physically good for the nature of the gorillas? I think it's quite a hard one to answer. I think the main way I'd ever answer that and look at it is by just outright saying yes. By allowing people, okay, to, fine. By allowing people, and sadly, stereotypically, if you're looking at Rwanda, wealthy people mm-hmm. to have the experience of this, you're educating people. Yeah, because it's so easy, and so I say it. But if you look at any of those sympathy adverts you get when you're at home, and it's like mm. sponsor gorilla and get a cuddly toy and monthly updates on your gorilla. It, it's education it's, it's, v- through familiarisation. Active, learn, active learning is always the best way. Being able to genuinely be in the presence of it. And then since that day, you know, that hasn't left me in like the thought of the gorilla. You sponsor the gorilla every month. No, because I don't like those adverts. And you sponsor a gorilla and then they send you a cuddly toy, which probably takes oh. up that month's sponsorship, right? I love a cuddly toy. And they've killed a gorilla to make the cuddly toy. <laughs> <laughs> No, so I think the educating, but also the money, right? The research that goes into it, the, if you look, 96 people a day, that's, mm-hmm. you know, they're making now almost 150,000 a day. Yeah. Which goes straight into guerrilla research. So if one of them gets ill, they can try and get in specialist medical help. They can pay all the staff there, mm-hmm. all the trackers yeah. to be part of it. And sadly you can't just rely on donations. So having a permit's the equivalent of a donation. It's just yeah. kind of a transactional cost, which is experiencing mm-hmm. the gorillas. Yeah, you've got the wear of the actual environment they're in, but mm-hmm. that's why Rwanda's they've now increased the cost. As well. And they've limited the footfall that can go through. So, and they try as much as they can to alternate the troops so it's not constant throughout the day seeing them. So I think at the moment there's 10% of every permit. So almost 15,000 a day. Mm-hmm. on a full day yeah which in rwanda is an enormous amount of money mm-hmm. goes to the local communities helping the schools helping the health centers helping with more you know infrastructure yeah. i think they also fund some of the farmers there so that was one of the problems with diane fossey was going to prove wrong is trying to show that there can be coexistence and that takes help now that they've got this research center where they've got the big money coming in they can make that even Mm -hmm. more plausible so if a gorilla comes into the farm and destroys some of the crop leave it there we will compensate you for that and that makes a huge difference because you want the gorillas to live you don't want the farmers to go and shoot them or anything you want them to be you know actually there's a gorilla in my field i'm going to get compensated for the loss of that but i don't have to go and kill one of these yeah one of these amazing creatures so that's where I think, you know, all the money coming in, it's hard to see a negative about it unless you want to make the argument of pure natural conservation of them having their wildlife and never seeing a human. Yeah, what about the, which you briefly said at the end of that sentence, what about the actual gorillas and the way their environment's changing by having more contact with humans? Do you think that affects them for the worse? Do you think there's such a thing as they could, in theory, not be wild anymore, even though they're in the wild, just because they they see are wild? Every they day? still trek. They can still cover kilometers of distance, and the trackers just need to keep keep that area. So it's not like you're locking them in a cage. You're not feeding them anything. They're mm. feeding themselves. They're making their own areas. You're minimizing the amount of damage going through their the trackers and all the staff there. Try and keep them as safe as possible. So. It's really hard to find the argument saying there's a negative impact. Someone out there maybe listening or watching today will make try and make some argument, but I think when you think about, you know, their numbers are actually growing for once. Mm. They're alive. There's money going into the community to make sure they're happy with them there. 
And the flip thing is, if they do start to wander near a farmer or something, they happen to come across a farmer. Having that tiny bit of interaction each day, knowing that we as humans don't want to kill them anymore, mm. means that they're not necessarily going to attack the farmer. Because if you had a gorilla in a field and the farmer accidentally stumbled across him and went, oh, the gorilla's in my field, there's not necessarily a massive instant negative output, which some animals there always will be. Yeah. So I think that's one of the ways to look at it. Okay. When you're on your tour and you said that you hike through the forest, how do you actually yeah. find the gorillas? Obviously, the trackers do it, but what do they do? So this is where we were absolutely amazed. So all the trackers, well, the vast majority of the trackers at the research centre used to go out and kill all the gorillas. The trackers in the research centre used to be poachers and they were convinced huh? they were convinced by the research center by diane any of them do you know well she would she helped set up the center yeah. so the practicality is there is you will earn more money because poachers don't make much money no they have to go out they have to attempt to try and find them and kill them and then they have to try and get whatever they need like teeth or any of the fur or any of that away without getting caught so they have no risk, they have a consistent job, they're getting paid, and they're doing something positive for the environment. And the knock-on effect of that is their community gets helped because all, there's all this money coming in. And the reason why the poachers are the best thing, and they, they were told, right, you won't get punished because we know you're poachers, but you can actually have a massive positive effect, is there is still some poaching going on, like very minimal. And if there's any old traps, poachers are the ones to know how to find a trap, how to spot a trap, how to disarm a trap. They are the best ones at finding mm -hmm. gorillas, knowing the signs to find gorillas. Yeah. If you, because their lives used to depend on finding these gorillas. Mm -hmm. Now you still have that application of their knowledge, Yeah. but in finding them for a positive reason. So how long did it take you to find your first gorillas? They knew exactly where they were because they're, con they're constantly going out and just yeah. roughly knowing where they are because they know within a certain range... They can only move so far within a time frame. So they they don't have trackers on them. They don't mm. physically have collar trackers on them or anything. They just roughly know where they are. So was it a hard walk? Was it was it they know where they are? <laughs> so but this was a funny but story. It's three hours away or <laughs> at the beginning of our hike, the beginning of our trek, with these two Russians in our group. <laughs> and one and of that was the funny bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of them is this massive bloke, right? Six foot two, big guy deep voice obviously. And, he, and he just like looked to the uh member staff and uh, the staff member was just explaining right well, having like told us like the initial brief like okay this is where we start the hike you just walk through a small farmer's field through a village mm -hmm. get to the base of one of the like sort of mountain sections and he just goes right so this is going to be a sort of like medium tray it won't be too hard if you need to stop just stop relax enjoy the view ask any questions you need um the trackers are just about to keep an eye out they'll be making sure they don't find any extra traps and having a think about where the gorillas are and this russian guy dead pan looks at the guy at the camera he just looks at the looks at the guide just like dead pans having heard that this is a medium hard check and he just goes medium but i ordered easy and we as a group there are seven other people in the group including his friend all just laughed all absolutely worse I'll tell laughing and he just looked dead on at the at the guide and the guy just went it's easy medium <laughs> and the guy just went but I ordered easy <laughs> he's like he just knew at that point in time I have to walk otherwise, I, otherwise I've wasted it, my yeah. money and I can't go and we were just wetting ourselves at this whole thing it was like what do you mean you ordered easy it's like you apply for a <laughs> permit you go and see gorillas you go and do what you're going to do did it, was he wearing appropriate clothing? Or because often yeah, he people looked, like that. He looked like he'd watched Tarzan or just Googled so he was just safari clothing. <laughs> <laughs> like just Googled safari clothing and just turned off in a stereotypical, you know, sort of full shirt, beige, safari yeah. style top, a big hat. It was pretty comical. But um no, the the walking didn't take too long. It was a fairly light hike up. It was nice, actually, <laughs> to be honest. So I assume there were no paths. It was just... I know, it's a path. You're not hacking okay. through. 
this is a point in sustainability morgan is yeah. then when they you have a path and of course you might you can it's not like the gorillas are just sat there waiting on the path like oh here guys it's our one o'clock appointment with the humans they're not just like oh, like right pretend to be gorillas again <laughs> that's not what's happening morgan it's uh well that that well that was why i'm asking it was a you so go you along the path explain. there are paths okay. you go along we hike for maybe like 45 mm -hmm. minutes and then they were 20 meters off the path and we just like then hack yeah. through a little bit but that's when the that's when the trackers take it a bit more serious because you're then approaching them and they need to be wary in case for some reason there is a trap there. They go through and machete away certain small section just so they know mm -hmm. it's clear. Did you come across any traps? Nope. Uh, no. Nope. Not a single trap. D did they say that they come across them ever or often? I don't think they come across them that often anymore. They know mm. there is the tiniest attempt of poaching around, but it's so hard now, especially that they know you've got these trackers who are unbelievably experienced poachers in their own right, they're armed. Mm -hmm. They want to protect them. So it's really hard. And on top of that now, you it's not just the trackers involved. It's the whole community because everyone benefits off the conservation of these mm -hmm. gorillas and the money coming in. So it's actually sort of everyone's against poachers quite strongly now, which is lovely to see. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the numbers growing, the golden monkey numbers are growing as well. But they come in, they come in troops of... I think the one we saw was probably anywhere between 60 and 200. Are they loads of a troop? Probably not. Yeah. Oh, they are? Yeah. So explain to me, when after you did the hike, what your actual first impression experience was when you really first saw the gorillas in the wild? So the first two that, as we were approaching, the first two in the troop that we saw, they were both lying down asleep, and you just saw their feet sticking out, and you just thought... God, that looks like my brother. I guess you're slightly worried about standing on them <laughs> as well. <laughs> they're pretty big, but it's like they were just so relaxed and they're like having a roll about, eating, the kids playing the swill boat just like stared us down. And it was it was just I think it takes so long to hit you. Mm -hmm. And then you turn around and you see the silverback grill and you're like, oh no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's massive. <laughs> he's like he's like he's on the way through scene. Two to three, a bit more of that. He's been roiding like hard. <laughs> he's like two to three times the size of any of the others, and he just watches you. His head is like this big, and he's just staring at you. And he's just like, and then you just like look at him, thinking like, you, in deep down inside of you, you're like, I'm an idiot doing this. I'm looking at, you know, like a 300 pound gorilla or whatever it is, or 300 kilo. I don't know how heavy. Is it, is it really? Is it really? Scary? And you just look at him and you just go. <laughs> yeah, we 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 just and you're get, just like this we, is not we, defensive. <laughs> were you just getting nervous before you had to do the first? And you're like, I oh, know you, you're doing that like before you got near them. Uh, like how how far back? Like when we started leaving the path, everyone's just starting to go. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just, and then you're just stood within them. And you start watching their personalities and so, their playfulness. So it's almost like um, w the seven dwarfs when you come to hear them and they come in, you can hear them singing as a troop coming from the <laughs> background. You can't see them, but it's like, oh. Well, there was like a small I hedge hope. in the way of one section, right? There was this bit of foliage. And I just thought, as we approached it, we're going, hmm. what if they thought we were like a... A moving hedge. We're a nemesis troop. And you just imagine just the silverback burst through this hedge thinking your name is true and you, you just stand there and just go like you know what take me like let's just make this quicker Hug. <laughs> it's like i'm not going to survive this so make it short and sweet and just punch through my rib cage <laughs> you just wouldn't survive but then you're within them <clears throat> but then you're sort of within them all and it's just yeah you're just in awe of them do they tell you what to do in case you are actually approached just be calm. Be calm. Not like lie on the floor off off of your weakest park as no, you as they do, do in Tarzan. You look at them and you just go, you know what? You can have me. Rock paper scissors. <laughs> they lose and just smash your fist <laughs> on the ground. Just punch straight through. Rock paper. Douche. <laughs> that is the hardest paper I've ever. No, felt. it's it's the same with any animal interaction. Is don't stress. Mm. The second you get stressed, that stress. And nerves are what any like alpha predator hate. They feel them. Yeah, they hate nerves. Lions hate nerves. Bears hate nerves. All apes will hate nerves. 
because if they feel you're nervous, that'll make them nervous. And mm. their natural instinct is aggression. Yeah. Especially for an alpha, right? Whereas any sort of lower down species, there's this flight, whereas mm -hmm. their natural instinct is to fight, especially a silverback. So his, the rest of his troop might step back or well, some of the younger males might mm -hmm. approach. But the silverback's just like, he'll just gun you down. So in a troop, why is there only one silverback? So when the males get to a certain age, like hitting puberty, right? Ooh. Is they then want to challenge to be the boss. Mm -hmm. And if they, they, they either win that challenge or they sort of just leave and take a female or two with them. Mm -hmm. And that either goes either way. And the problem is that's one of the things they try and avoid in the conservation. They do try and steer them apart from each other so the troops don't collide. Otherwise, you know, you could have all these gorillas, but then all of a sudden there could be a bloodbath between the silverbacks. Planet of the because Apes, it's massive war. That's between humans, humans and... But Not always. <clears throat> no, no, there was the, the one that they always fought Caesar. Oh, yeah, there was, yeah. But that's the thing is they're trying to... They're trying to sort of isolate them as much as they can, but there is only, well, as far as I know, there's only one silverback per troop, mm -hmm. and then the mayor either wins the battle or they'll just leave. And in general, and set up their own little the death, troop. It can be. Yeah, or to the point where they think, nope, someone run, looks like, nope, yeah, run, boys, <laughs> run, boy, run. Just take one of the yeah. females from the troop with you. Right, we're going. So right now we're going to put a photo on the screen. And the first thing I want you to do for the podcast listeners is to explain exactly what the photo on the screen is. And then I want you to explain how you took the photo and maybe the camera settings that you used when taking the photos. So this photo right here Beautiful. is the exact moment I thought, right, if I capture this now and I die... At least someone knows exactly who killed me. And this was me taking this photo. Were you making eye contact? Deadpan eye contact to the silverback. So this is the silverback here, just deadpan staring at me. And I just thought, right, this is it. I've done my... <gasps> He's staring at me now. So he either what? likes me way too much or wants to kill me. So I thought, you know what's best? I'll grab out this metal box, which goes... Get my camera out. What was the crop of the photo? So, to anyone listening who can't see it on the screen right now, like our YouTube watchers, is this is the whole face, just the sort of face with a light background of the foliage of the silverback gorilla staring me down the lens. And I was maybe oh, seven to eight meters away from it. So, they say on the guided tours before you go, oh, you'll only get a maximum of this distance from it. I could have stroked half the gorillas, which I saw. Really? Yeah. Because you just like walk between them and then they all sort of roll a little bit closer to you. If. Whereas the silverback was fairly far. Does like, your heart sort of jump when they're rolling no, close? No, not, not the small ones because they're actually not massive. They're just they could probably still rip rip my leg off. But the silverback, you're just sort of eyeing up thinking all these others look like mere, you know, they look like squirrels and you're a rhinoceros compared to them. Mm. It's just like enormous. Yeah. Great analogy, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was staring down this gorilla, took the photo. That obviously doesn't annoy a gorilla, apparently. Yeah, I got back and when I was editing it, I wanted to... I don't know why. I think when you're shooting animals, there's something about making it black and white. I thought about doing it in the manual settings beforehand, but I really wasn't sure how I was going to capture because I think when you're capturing an animal and you feel like there's emotion in it, having so much color can take away from that. Mm -hmm. Especially when you have that eye staring straight at you, there's something so nice about black and white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my favorite photographer, um, Paul Nicklin. Oh. Paul Nicklin, who's sort of the granddaddy of Nat Geo photography, uses black and white for so many of his photos. And you start to understand why the more you apply it to your own. Mm. so you know drag and drop that into photoshop played around with it played with the shadowing and the highlights and this was the outcome um but to be honest 
I don't think I did anything fancy. I think I was really lazy because when it's an interaction like this, I actually hate taking photographs. I know it sounds really weird. <laughs> um, because I'm, if I was doing it for a job, then you have a literal purpose to be there and it's the only reason you're really there. You but you understand the you're, moment. But it really is. Yeah. If you're there, you think, okay, at most I've got 25 minutes with these gorillas. Mm-hmm. In your whole lifetime, you know it's not going to happen again. Why do I want to be staring at my camera settings? So I think I just left it on auto. Bought a decent lens with me, which was, I know, it's basically, you know, a sin. But at the same time, it meant I was actually focusing on the experience that was there because I think if you went there and you were just photographing like mad and, yeah, I know it hurts you, Morgan, but it's the fact that, you know, I was enjoying where I was. Um that's not enjoyable. It was. Because if I spent the whole time like, oh, yeah, I really need a photo, then you're just not enjoying what you're watching. Like 99% of watching the tiny little baby gorilla jump on his mom and play around. We were just watching. I wasn't getting my camera out and trying to film or right. photograph every second because I think that ruins it. Of course not. No, because that, that doesn't sound like it would have been a good photo because it would have been so much movement and you would have had to have spent so much time just trying to get a good photo whereas the one where he's directly looking at you that's obviously a good photo opportunity and this is something that we briefly touched upon in the previous photography episode about being in the moment and it's not going for those hard risky shots that you're going to take 15 billion attempts to get it's going for the easy pretty ones like this one here exactly so yeah i'd say if you can in your lifetime see the gorillas do not stress about the photography. How did you know about my next question? Would you recommend going to the gorillas? <laughs> a billion percent. Always. So you want me to go there a million times? Yes. Exactly. Mm. I, th- I think there's... I'm not, I don't, not there's sure few I experiences in your life. analysis of that. <laughs> there are few experiences in your life where you experience something like that. You know, people go off to, you know, that favourite place in the world, Dubai, with zero culture or anything. And then you go to somewhere like Rwanda or Uganda or Democratic Republic of Congo, amazing community, amazing history of culture, doing something amazing for the world. And why not? You you might die. You can't afford it. Uh, you might it might be yeah. Hard to okay, get the these visas. you know the, <laughs> the visa is not too bad to get. Is it not? That was a, that that no, should have been a question. I'll yeah. never struggle getting a visa to any African country. That that is a benefit of uh, having of having strong colonized pa- half of it. Having a strong passport. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's got really strong, um, like cover. It's unbreakable. I've ruined mine. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> <laughs> but oh uh, yeah, I'd completely recommend it. Hundred billion trillion percent. There's definitely something that. Even before speaking to you about it, you want to see on my list, and I so want to do. If you're watching or listening today. I do recommend it, but obviously, it's an expensive experience. But you know, the where is it? It's the Democratic Republic of Congo, four hundred dollars. If you smoke and you're For watching this, or you're listening on a podcast and you think it's unafford, unaffordable, then quit smoking. And every time you would buy a pack of cigarettes, stick that in a jar and by the end of the year, you could afford this. Fair enough. So we have mentioned that to see the mountain gorillas, you need to go to either Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo or Uganda. Where can you find the lowland gorillas? Where it's a little bit lower. Okay, so it must be in Atlantis then. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you find the lowland gorillas, then you've also found Atlantis. So Nobel Prize is sort of like sat there waiting. Fantastic. Any any other places? No. No, not not Central African Republic. There's that as well, but it's not quite Atlantis. There's that. Well, uh, no, but it is one of the best places to track <laughs> lowland gorillas. <laughs> it is, and that's definitely on the list. But I, I yeah, s- would you go? Would you go again? Like, what is the do you think mountain gorillas are better to see than lowland gorillas? Or do I you haven't think seen lowland needs, gorillas. Or do so you, I cannot give a yeah, but fair... Do you, do you just want to see one and then you've seen all gorillas? No, I'd, I'd love to go and see them. 
Well, plus I'll be in a different country, which I've never been to before. Very true. And obviously you're trying to get to every country in Africa, yet we don't have a single view in Africa. Exactly. So if you know someone who or three lives people. in Africa, yeah, is, if you know at least one person who lives in Africa, well, it doesn't even send have to them, live there, just physically be there. Send them this podcast right this second, right this second. Or a minute ago. Two seconds ago, five seconds ago. Send them this podcast so we can tick off somewhere in Africa. Because currently, we're in over 30 countries around the world that we're being listened to. And not Africa. Don't know why. Could not see why not. Don't know why. So well, maybe after this episode, we will. Yeah, so we're doing more, more African-based co- content so, so that we're going to get that. Exactly. Exactly. That's the plan. And if you have seen gorillas before and you, you either agree with what... Will says, or he's a very disagreeable person, so that's also very possible. Comment on our Instagram, at the BKS Travel, and actually tell Will that he's wrong. Yeah, message below. Below, well, actually, whilst you're going below, just here, there's a big subscribe button. Click that. Click like on the video, which is over here. On YouTube. Make sure you ring that bell as well, because then you'll get notified about our launch every Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Because mm. we're launching it's very a, important to watch another episode every single week, every single week, forever. And the other benefit of watching and listening to our podcast is that we're giving you tips, tricks, all about travel, how to enjoy it most, how to save some money. I know this episode money. wasn't the most cost-conscious uh, adventure that we've spoken about, Didn't but they we find do. Money in uh, Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> We talk about a lot of saving money. Every three episodes, we do a cost episode on how to save some cash hula. Cash hula. Whether it's saving money from being savvy in the airport, saving money whilst in a country, saving money booking your hotel. We'll help you save money. Enjoy your holidays. And roll the outro. Boo! Yeah, let's make it happen. I hope that you can handle uh, going on adventures, best kept secret travels. Yeah, all over the globe, having fun. You know the deal. Amazing secret locations. Hang out with Morgan and Will. Uh, educate and entertain. Haggle in the market. Uh, sharing their experiences. Time to get it started. Let's go.